when are particular circumstances when you would use XGBoost? So we already talked about tabular data. So it sounds mm -hmm. like basically anytime you have tabular data would be a time to use it. Are there other circumstances as well, or is that kind of the that's that's the key time? Well, tabular data is sort of key, but let me maybe go into some nuance of like, I mean, in the Python world, you've got a bunch of options like scikit-learn implements a bunch of algorithms that you could use. And, and I will note that there are other uh, extreme gradient boosted uh, libraries as well, uh, like CatBoost or LightGBM, which at a 20,000 foot point of view are very similar to doing what XGBoost is doing. But but some of the reasons why you might want to consider one of these uh, extreme gradient boosted decision tree models is if, if you have complex relationships in your data. So a nice thing about decision trees is that they can capture nonlinear data. And an example I like to use uh, for a while I worked um, in, in helping create solid state storage devices. So this is like NAND flash SSD type devices. And I'm not a hardware person, but I found out that there's this uh, oddity where if you have a piece of NAND flash, it has a tendency to die uh, during infancy. And then if you get it passed into like the teenage years, it will work fine and then the uh, the electrons get stuck again in the end. So there's like this bathtub curve of like at the front, um, it, there is a chance that it might not work. But once you get it past a certain point, it's basically going to work until it gets to the end of life. And, and so, you know, if you're using like a logistic regression model, it can't capture that nonlinearity if you're looking at age of, of the device, right? You can just say, as the age of the device goes up, either I'm more prone to failure or less prone to failure. But but given a single column, that like logistic regression wouldn't be able to make a, a prediction from that. Whereas a decision tree could say, okay, I'm first going to look at the age, and if it's less than some amount, then I'm going to say maybe it's more likely. And if it's greater than, and then it can look at the age again after it's done that split and capture those nonlinearities. So so that's. I, I think that's super useful. This is a feature of decision trees in general. So random forests and decision trees have that. Uh, another thing that you can get by using a library like XGBoost is interactions. And so interactions are the, uh, it's, you know, going back to our Titanic model, it's okay, are you a female? Well, there might be a difference between a female in first class and a female in third class, right? So we can split on gender, but then we can also split on class after that. And if we see in our trees that we often split on gender and then class after that, that would tell us that there might be a relationship between those two. And again, this is something that um, using logistic regression or some of these other models can't really capture relationships like that or interactions unless you would start encoding that into the data right make a new column that's like we're going to take these two columns and multiply them together or for the example of our u-shaped curve bathtub curve where you say like okay we're going to make a new column as the age less than teenage years and make another column as the age an indicator column for the age is greater than uh, old age sort of thing. So, so, so as, as a data person, I find that super interesting that like there are these relationships between the data and these algorithms can find them for us and, and help us uh, uncover them. Even, even after the fact, we can look at the results and, and start understanding our data better from that. Uh, again, XGBoost is a relatively performant model and 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 so you might want if you want good results and you might there might be some trade-offs that you're willing to make uh xgboost might be a model to use and then uh going back to that you know what's in the data i, I do kind of like to use xgboost to go back and understand what's going on with my data and so i, I would say using xgboost as a mechanism to do EDA or exploratory data analysis 
Um, or if you think of like this machine learning life cycle of we're going to make ask a question, we're going to make a model, we're going to look at the results, and, and then this might have a cycle in it or multiple cycles in it. And oftentimes I've, I've found that like after I evaluate my XGBoost model, I have insights into the data that I didn't have initially that might help me make a better model after that. Yeah, really great points there. Um, so just to kind of recap them, one of the another one of the things that makes XGBoost so powerful is that it automatically handles nonlinearities and interactions. And so that's actually that's similar to why deep learning can outperform regression models in other kinds of cases. So XGBoost um, is again great for tabular data, whereas deep learning, you might say, you know, if you're working with image data or video data or natural language data, you might think, okay, deep learning is the way to go first. But with either approach, XGBoost or deep learning, what makes them so powerful is that they handle these nonlinearities, they handle these interactions between input features in the model fully automatically. Yeah, so super powerful. And, and then to distinguish between deep learning and XGBoost, and another reason other than just the tabular versus non-tabular data kind of situation is that XGBoost can be way more performant, not just on the training data, but actually in production as well. So uh, when people are using um, ChatGPT today, they, they see like words coming out kind of one by one or characters coming out individually. Um, and I mean, that is a, an extreme example <laughs> of a model with a lot of weights. And given how many weights are involved, it's pretty remarkable that you can get answers in real time. But um, XGBoost in production, I've, any XGBoost algorithm that I've ever seen works instantaneously. Uh, there is no lag, even on you know relatively inexpensive CPU hardware running on the server. Yeah, yeah, those are good points.